Good morning, everyone. My name is Adam Gussin, Head of Product and Sales Training for COFAS North America, and thank you for logging in for today's presentation. We'll be hearing from Ruben Nizard, COFAS economist from the North American region. Ruben will share with us critical information regarding the economic impact of the current COVID-19 pandemic related to the retail sector, specifically for the United States and Canada. Ruben joined COFAS in 2016 with the Group Economic Research Department located in France. He's been responsible for COFAS country risk analysis in Africa, as well as contributing to the COFAS analysis of the oil market and the COFAS political risk index. Before being appointed to his current role, uh, Ruben uh, holds a master's degree in economics and business from Sciences Po Paris. Sciences Po is an international research university ranking globally among the finest institutions in the social sciences. Before I bring Ruben on, just want to address uh, one uh, housekeeping item. Uh, we'll be using uh, the chat feature for questions. So any questions you have throughout the webinar, please feel free to type your questions and we'll uh, answer them as, as, uh, as they fit into the, into the program. Uh, please let us know if you have a problem seeing or hearing. Uh, we'll be able to respond to you as well. And uh, again, everyone's gonna be on mute, so we have a sound quality where we can all hear. Uh, so the chat's gonna be your only, only way to, to interact. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Ruben Nizard. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us um, this, this morning uh, for this uh, new webinar on the impact of COVID-19. So today we will focus mainly on the impact of COVID-19 on the retail sector. So why the retail sector? Well, the retail sector is critical to the, the North American economies and it's been one of the worst hit sectors, um, as we will see uh, in a minute uh, with this presentation. And it's really important, it's a very critical uh, sector to, um, to many of you. That's why we decided to focus on, on this sector. Uh, but before diving into the sector that has been through uh, a rough patch over the past the past couple of years, um, um, maybe just um, I would like to start with a reminder of COFAS economic scenario um, and then to, to move on to how it uh, affects um, the scenario for the retail uh, sector. So if we can move on to uh, the first slide, um, we will just see a quick reminder of our uh, scenario. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you can see on our scenario of uh, the pandemic situation. So our scenario um, was that, we'll, and that's what we've seen so far, that in Q1, we will see the, the peak of, of new cases in China, uh, that pandemic, uh, the, the, the localized Chinese epidemic would move to uh, to Europe and, uh, and North America. Lockdowns have started to roughly uh, in early March, mid-March. And we were, uh, we were, we were forecasting, uh, we were thinking that these lockdowns would last approximately two months. That's why we were thinking that these lockdowns would end uh, in late April, early May. So that's what we're currently seeing. Uh, the, the discussion and the focus uh, is, up, is on the reopening of the economy. Um, federal guidelines in the US for social distancing have expired uh, on Friday um, and many states and uh, in the US and many provinces uh, in Canada are starting um, to, to reopen some uh, some stores and, and some locations uh, to, to, to get the economy back on track. Um, one very important aspect of our scenario for the global economy and for North America is that the reopening process will be gradual. Uh, I have to insist on this word um, to avoid what would be a risk scenario, meaning a second wave of, uh, of the pandemic that would be devastating 
uh, for for the economy. Um, well, the, the reopening process will probably be will probably be very gradual, including in the U.S., where we have seen some discussions uh, and, and some, some 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 statements being a bit more bold. Uh, we still expect that the reopening process will be very gradual, as uh, as we can see from the federal guidelines that have been uh, uh, that have been published uh, two weeks ago by the White House. So, in terms of economy of, of the economy, how does it translate? It translates into a very deep contraction in economic activity. So, the sharpest contractions since uh, since the great financial crisis of 2008-2009. We can see, you can see on the right hand side chart the actual GDP figures, um, so the quarter on quarter uh, GDP figures at an annualized rate for the US. And you can see that in Q1 2020, uh, as the economy came to a standstill uh, in mid March, uh, the economy contracted by 0.48%. So this is the worst contraction uh, since, uh, since the great financial crisis, since Q4 2008. Uh, we expect that this contraction in Q1 will be followed by an even bigger uh, contraction in the second quarter of 2020. Um, so we are currently forecasting that the, the decline in um, in Q2 could be about 19, 19 and 20% uh, at an annualized rate in the second quarter, uh, as meant as the economy was mostly in lockdown uh, over uh, over the whole months of April. So that's that. That quarterly figures would translate into a forecast for 2020 for the U.S. for 2.9 contractions uh, in the U.S. and a 3.5 percent contraction uh, of GDP in Canada. Both would be the worst contractions uh, since in the post World War II era, uh, and there is a downward bias to our forecast. So. We will be updating very uh, very soon our forecast, and we will keep you informed on, on the evolution of our scenario. But if we can move on to the next scenario, and what will be of interest to us is what is the impact of this uh, of this lower activity and of this contracting activity on businesses. So this contraction in business in, in GDP translate into the highest level in business bankruptcies globally again since the global financial crisis of 2008-2009. So you can see that at the global level we forecast a 25% increase uh, in business insolvencies and this increase uh, in world insolvencies will be driven by North America and by the US where we expect business bankruptcies to rise by 39% uh, this year. So why do we expect this surge in, uh, in, in business bankruptcies? Because of the lower activity and of three simultaneous shocks that are taking place right now at the global level and that are eating the North American economies. So the first shock is the supply side shock. We've seen supply chain disruptions affecting many industries. We've seen also uh, there's a second shock, which is a shock on commodity prices that is having a particularly uh, devastating impact on the energy industry with oil pricings falling to two decade lows. Uh, and we will even see, uh, we, we have even seen in the past few weeks, uh, prices turn negative for the US WTI crude oil prices benchmark. And it's going to drive um, higher bankruptcies in the energy sector. And the third shock that we are seeing and currently experiencing is a shock on the demand side. Uh, so the shock on the demand side is the one that is going to be of particular interest, interest to us today when looking at the retail sector, because the retail sector is mainly driven by this demand component and by household consumption. And as you have seen, one of the main contributors uh, to the decline in GDP in Q1 2020 has been a decline in household consumption. So if we can look at the next slide, we will see why we anticipate that this retail sector is gonna, is gonna be one of the worst sectors and is gonna drive this, uh, uh, this rise in bankruptcy. So with these two charts, you can see the mobility trends in North America. So both in the US on the left-hand side and in Canada on the right-hand side. So these data are taken from Google Maps and they are mobility data 
that are anonymized and and take and, and published by Google to uh, to share uh, with the public what we've seen. And what is particularly conspicuous is that since mid March, you can see the very deep contraction uh, in, in in people going in, in people uh, movement to work in people uh, movement to retail and recreation facilities uh, and to uh, transit stations. At the same time as we're seeing this slump uh, in, 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 in people going to, to these places, we're seeing a rise in people staying at home. Uh, that's what you can see in the dark blue line with the people staying in, in the, at their residence. So, so this is the first round effect in the retail sector. Because with the stay-at-home orders in the U.S. and with uh, the social distancing guidelines uh, taking place in, in Canada as well, we have seen retail stores close gradually. And actually, ret many retails, uh, retail stores have started to close their businesses even before uh, states started to implement the stay-at-home orders. That's why you can see that even before the federal guidelines were issued, um, the 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 people going to uh, to retail stores were already falling. Another interesting aspect of these two charts is to look at what has been happening for grocery and pharmacies, which are two key aspects of the retail sectors. We can see that at first they were more resilient and that actually that people going to were going more to grocery stores and pharmacies to, to, to build stocks and to make sure that they had, not, had enough foods uh, going into a lockdown. But you can also see that once the lockdown started and that people seeing that they could access, still access food and, and, and pharmaceutical uh, and, and pharmaceutical staples, well, they started to go to, to go less to these uh, to these places. It doesn't mean that there was a decline in these sales. It just means that people have reduced their travels to grocery stores. So these are two key takeaways um, of, of these lockdowns, people going less as, as, as retail source figures, uh, as, as retail stores are closed. And what is gonna be very interesting to look at is how the situation evolves uh, in the next few days. And we will we'll be waiting uh, the, the most, most recent data as many retail stores are reopening, for instance, Macy's, uh, so the biggest, one of the biggest department store in North America, is opening uh, 70 stores today. So that's something that we will be very monitoring very closely to see if people return to um, return to retail uh, to retail stores. But what we can see and with the next slide is that it's already having an impact on retail sales and on retail behavior. And on um, if we can move on to the previous slide first. Um, yes, thank you. So. Here on the on the, on the left hand side chart, you can see the unprecedented impact of these business closures. So, with retail stores closed, you can see that it recorded um, the, work, the the biggest decline and the steepest decline uh, in the history of these uh, of the retail sales indicators. So, it, the indicator exists since 1992, and you can see. It declined by 8.4% uh, month on month in March 2020. So you can you can already, you can see that compared to the 2009 crisis, uh, it's 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 far worse than the 3.9% decline that we've seen uh, at the worst of the crisis in November 2008. So it shows how deep the impact is and how people were forced and, and were not able to consume and were not able to. Um, to, 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 to buy uh, at, at, retail, at retail stores because of the lockdown. So how does it impact um, retailers? So you can see uh, on the right hand side chart the impact for um, Canadian uh, for Canadian businesses uh, in several industries. And you can see that all industries, most industries, more than half of the industries recorded, uh, declines in their revenues uh, of more than 20% compared to last year. That's what you can see with the all industries bar on, on the on the left hand side of the of this right hand side chart. And when you look at by the impact by sector, you can see that the retail trade sector is one of the worst affected industries. We have more than 60% of, uh, of 
retail uh, retailers reporting that they've seen a decline in their revenues of more than 20 percent and there's only two industries that recorded uh that reported worse uh worse decline and that reported worse declines in their revenues that the entertainment sectors and the hospitality and food services sector so you can see from these figures that the retail sector is being very, very deeply impacted to an extent that was never seen before. But what is interesting is to look at what's happening a little bit more into details. And that's what you'll see in the next slide. Because there is a very differentiated impact by when you look at, at different segments in the retail, uh, in retail sectors. So what you can see with, um, with these two charts is consumption, personal consumption expenditure uh, breakdowns by by sectors and the mass retail sales by type of retailers and both these charts show that the impact uh, on the retail sectors is mostly being felt uh, on retailers of durable goods and for retails for durable goods so what are these durable goods durable goods are goods that are meant to to last more than three years so they, these are, are products that range from a toaster up to, to a car. And you can see that this 15% decline in durable goods, for instance, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the personal consumption expenditure is driving this trend of lower, uh, of, of lower, retail, of lower retail sales and of lower consumption by households. So it's driven by, by sales in the, in, in, by auto sales, but also by, and that's what you can see on the right hand side chart, by sales of furniture, home furnishing, uh, home appliances, electronics, which are also, and that's important to note, consumer discretionary. And that's the second key takeaway from these charts. Because when you look at the non durable goods item, you can see that there's a rise uh, of 4.5% in, in consumptions. For durable for non-durable goods but it's mainly driven by one single uh one single sub item it's the food and beverage meant for consumption uh at home and that you can see here an increase of 19.1 percent uh in in food and beverage uh sale in, in food and beverage spending and an increase of 25 percent at food and beverage stores um but when you look at it in more detail you can see that actually most other categories of non durable goods uh, are recording declines. And the key elements is then, are these, uh, are these goods consumer staples or consumers discretionary? And you can see that consumers discretionary are falling much more than consumer staples. And consumer staples are actually recording growth. So you can see that with, for instance, the clothing and footwear uh, retailers, which has experience with, uh, which are some of the worst hit uh, retailers uh, in, uh, in North America. The final uh, thing that I want to emphasize with this chart is on the right hand side chart. It's the rise of, of non star retailers. So as you would expect, uh, online sales rose uh, with, uh, with, closed, with stores being closed. But you can see also from these figures that it is far from offsetting uh, the impact uh, of the closure of stores, because what you have to, to keep in mind is that despite the, the important rise of non-store retailers of, of online buying, well, most stores, uh, mo most most purchases are still made at physical stores. So, so that's another key takeaway from this crisis. Uh, non-store retailers cannot offset for now. Uh, the, the closure of, uh, of, of, the, of, 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 of retail locations and of brick and mortar retail stores. But this, what is also important to note as we move on to the next phase of this COVID-19 crisis, the reopening process, it's also important to look at what will be the long lasting impact of the COVID-19 crisis. And if we move on to the next slide, that's uh, you'll see you'll see some elements that uh, that that feed our cautiousness on these sectors going forward. So just to give you a little bit of context, um, the, the 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 U.S. labor market has been very strong in the past decade, and it has 
unemployment rate has fallen to a, a half a century low uh, and, and was at a half century low before the crisis at 3.5%. Uh, and this low unemployment rate has helped to, uh, to, to support the consumers' disposable income. And that's what you can see on the right-hand side chart, disposable income has risen, and it has supported consumer confidence. But as we move them with the business closures and has people started to, uh, to, to not being able to, to, uh, to consume, you can see that the consumer feelings started to fall. But the other impact of this COVID-19 crisis was that because of the business closures, we've seen massive layoffs being conducted. And it's been, it's been notably seen with the weekly jobless claims figures with more than 30 million Americans filing for unemployment uh, insurance over the past six weeks. And you can see that it is dwarfing anything that we've seen before in terms of, 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 of impact to the labor market. So it translates into uh, a higher unemployment rate, and we've already seen the unemployment rate rise from 3.5% to 4.5% to 4.4% in March 2020. And we expect the, the April figure to, to rise above 10% uh, unemployment rate um, in April. So we'll see these figures being released on, on Friday, and they will probably show an increase uh, above 10%. And this increase above 10% will be the highest unemployment rates since the Great Recession, the Great Depression um, in the 1930s. So this uh, very high unemployment rate translates into lower disposable personal income, which bodes ill for the future of the retail sectors, because it means that con consumer spending in the, next, in the next months is going to remain very cautious and it's going to exacerbate uh, the challenges of the retail sectors. And these challenges of the retail sectors um, are, uh, have been very high in the past couple of years. And if we can move on to, to the next um, slide, we will see some of these uh, challenges. The retail sectors has been experiencing an increased level of bankruptcies in the past three to two years because um, of three main reasons. The first reason is what you can see on this chart um, is the rise of online of online buying. So you can see from with these figures of, of market share by retailers uh, in the past 25 years that uh, non-store retailers have risen from about four three percent of market shares to more than 15 percent of market share now, and it's mainly due to the rise of online buying, and and it has it has put a challenge to many retailers and especially um, to the retailer that were the, the, the shining star of the US economy at some point, malls and department stores. And you can see that the, the decrease in department store sales uh, of the market shares for department stores has been very rapid in the past, uh, in the past uh, 25 years. We expect the COVID-19 crisis to exacerbate this movement because many people have switched to online buying uh, to cope with the business closures. And we expect this trend of rising market share for, for online buying to continue and even to, uh, to continue at a faster pace going forward. But the second challenge, it's also important to highlight the, the other challenges of, of the retail sectors to understand why there has been higher retail bankruptcies in the, in the retail business and why we see higher retail bankruptcies going forward. So one of the other reasons for increased bankruptcies is changing consumers' behavior. So in addition to online buying, um, there's another trend is that consumers now um, are consuming more experience uh, related services rather than goods. So it translates into topper and, and lower sales for retailers. So that's the second trend uh, having an impact on, on business on profitability for retailers. But the main reason for the increase uh, in bankruptcies in the retail sectors and is that it's going in, to uh, feed into uh, bankruptcies in the context of, this, of the COVID-19 crisis. It's a very high level of debt that uh, many retailers have. So retailers have piled up um, a lot of debt after the 2008-2009 crisis because of the low uh, interest rates. And we were already seeing more and more retailers struggling to refinance these debt in the past two years. And that's why it's been more difficult 
uh, and that's why we've seen more bankruptcies in the sector. Um, and with the context of lower sales and many retailers being actually smaller after the COVID-19 crisis, we have to expect that this high level of debts are going to are going to have an impact, uh, a very deep impact on retailers, and it's going to translate in a, to a very high level of bankruptcies in 2020, in 2021. So that's something that we have to expect for the foreseeable future, and that's something that we have to, to be prepared for. Another thing that we have to look at when going forward and what will be the leg legacy of the COVID-19 crisis is what you see on the right-hand side chart, is that we will probably see some changing consumer behavior of, because of this crisis. So lower sales uh, of consumer discretionary that I mentioned are probably gonna linger for longer term than just, um, than just, just for this very specific period that we are experiencing now. And the focus on, on consumer staples that you can see here with formal health, beauty, food and beverage, household supply, uh, increased sales in these sectors is probably, is probably gonna, gonna, gonna continue as in the months going forward, um, households remain, remain cautious and remain focused on, 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 their, on, on the essentials. So with these words, I'd like to conclude these presentations. We can now move on to the Q&A session. We also have Ken Moyle, uh, our head of underwriter with, of underwriting with us, that might address some of your questions and, 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 and answer some of them. Ruben, thank you very much. Uh, so we, we have a couple questions already. And first, while we still have this slide on the screen, um, when we look at the market share by type of retailer, uh, what do what do we do with the with the revenue that's generated online by department stores or warehouse clubs? Is that in the department store or warehouse club category, or is that in the non-store retailer data? That's in the non-store retailers data, and that's a very good question because it highlights it and it also highlights one of the key feature of uh, of consumers' behavior during during the crisis. Well, we've seen increased online buying in, in the past few, in, in the past months. This increased online buying was mostly at, at online retailers that also had brick and mortar retail locations. So it, it tells you a lot about how crucial it is for, for retailers to still have brick and mortar star retail places today. Uh, and, and that brick and mortar retail is not quite dead yet. And even though it has online retailing has risen quite fast, you can still see that more than 80% of, uh, of, of, of retail sales are being made um, in, uh, in, in retail stores. So, so these are some very interesting trends and department stores have been, might have been able to weather a little bit the crisis with their online buying, uh, with, with their online buying. We've seen, for instance, that, uh, that some big retailers, including Walmart, Target, have reported that they had cash on the impact in the first quarter, uh, thanks to their retail sales, uh, to their, their online retail, and to people stockpiling. But it was not enough to offset uh, the impact of lower, of lower sales. Great. And then the, the next question I have, Ruben, um, when we look at uh, the, obviously, the, the political discussion, uh, you know, no one has a, a crystal ball uh, as far as policy, but there has been uh, talk about additional tariffs on Chinese goods, um, you know, given the supply chain. Uh, are we taking into account increase in tariffs? Are we just keeping an eye on it? You know, wh wh where do we see that going? Um, well, Last week's statements uh, by President Donald Trump um, were clearly worrying on that front uh, because he announced that he had solid evidence that that the COVID uh, that the coronavirus uh, was originating from a lab in China uh, and that in retaliation um, the U.S. was considering putting uh, further tariffs uh, in place that would put further strains on some supply chains. Um, so that's something we're keeping an eye on, uh, but our, our, our scenario on that one was not very optimistic. We, 
we think that the phase one deal that was reached uh, in, in, in last December uh, has a very limited reach and that it has not reduced substantially tariffs. So uh, right now we are still operating with, with a level of tariffs that is at about 20% uh, in, in, on average. Uh, compared to a level of less than 5% before the trade war started. So that's something that, yeah, that we have to keep in mind. Tariffs are still very high and are going to remain very high. And if uh, with, with, this, uh, with this restoring uh, uh, um, that is probably going to mount as the, the presidential election approach, um, well, yeah, it's probably, we're probably going to see more, more measures on that front. But, uh, what does it mean in the short term? It probably means that the phase one deal um, will, will, will be put on hold. Uh, the phase two negotiations, um, well, they were already being delayed by the COVID-19 crisis and that will probably take, uh, take, take more, more, more months to, uh, to, 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 to become uh, material. So that's, that's, that's some worrying sign that on that front, we should expect that there will be no improvement uh, on the tariff front. Okay. Uh, this next question uh, might be for you or, or Ken Moyle. Uh, it seems that COFAS is expecting significant bankruptcies in retail for fiscal year 20 and 21. Based on your expectations, are you reducing retail coverage without seeing significant markers or more information on the expectation level? Um, so I guess in, in, in general, uh, one, I guess, have we started making reductions in, in retail and are we going to continue and, and how will the, the rate of defaults and uh, frequency or severity of bankruptcies impact our coverage in the retail market? Well, uh, that's a, a big question. Um, as you know, we're, we're not here to buy losses, we're to cover the unexpected loss. Um, this crisis has put a lot of the retailers in, in a difficult position, uh, losing as much as a quarter uh, sales. In past years, we would see marginal retailers fail if they had a, a three or four or five decrease in sales. So um, uh, in many cases, the banks have been supportive in, in uh, providing additional liquidity. But uh, those that had a short... Um, uh, runway to turn things around are, are hitting the wall, so to speak. So we, we are reducing exposures accordingly, although, you know, quite frankly, during the months of uh, March and, and April, uh, very few non-food retailers really even accepted any merchandise uh, from uh, their vendors. In fact, they, they returned uh, merchandise and close their distribution centers and now as they slowly reopen they, there's a big juggling going on and that complicates their access to financing because they typically borrow against their inventory so uh, to get that borrowing base it's it's a bigger challenge so it, it's a real mess all, all way around all right thank you ken um one very specific question what product category uh are the sales of flowers in and i, I would imagine that they it might be in in supermarkets and food and beverage as well yeah. as club and superstores there there isn't really a, a section that would would really cover all of flowers is there yeah uh usually they're 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 in they're in various categories they're mostly at uh in the in the in the food and retail uh, in retail stores by type of when when we look at, uh, at the data by type of retailers um, and well they uh, if you look at very uh, at flower stores uh, well they've been faring uh, okay uh, when you look at, at some uh, at some of the data because well people are staying more at home so they they wanted to have some uh, some flowers and plants at home so so. It's been one of the of the categories of product that have been um, that have been a bit more resilient uh, in in the context of the COVID nineteen crisis. Okay, um, the questioner writes: uh, Walmart and Target have been able to remain open uh, largely. Is your confidence level in Walmart and Target 
different than other retailers in terms of uh, their ability to uh, stay open? So, well, uh, I'll start and then Ruben could pick up. Uh, Target and Walmart are big food retailers. In fact, Target, uh, uh, well, Walmart anyway, sells more groceries than the largest grocery retailer, Kroger. Um, also, they both uh, sell a lot of uh, non-discretionary items. They sell very little in terms of durable goods. So uh, they've been able to uh, maintain a lot of their revenue. They have omni-channel uh, e-sale. So curbside pickup is, is a much easier option for them than if you're uh, a, a mall store where, where you can't um, capture the same type of arrangement. Yes, I agree 100 percent with uh, with Ken's uh, analysis. Um, and well, it should be added that we're moving into the reopening phase. So I, I don't think we should be worried about about business closures for Walmart or Target in, in the short term now. Uh, uh, we'll see uh, if there's a second wave that might happen. But uh, but since with, with what Ken just said, it's it seems uh, it seems far off. Great, thanks so much. Um, before we get to, to our next question, just want to remind everyone that in the handout section, the slides for today's presentation are available, and there will be a link provided for uh, a recording of the, of the entire webinar. The, the next question we have, we're seeing many more people participating in running, cycling, and other uh, sporting activities. Uh, do we see this impacting uh, the retail sector for sporting goods? Uh, well, a lot of retail sporting goods, wholesalers and retailers were struggling in the past couple of years as they've lost more and more of their sales to Amazon and other e-commerce. While activity uh, is picking up, you have to remember that a lot of team sports have been totally suspended. Uh, a lot of pro sports schedules have been suspended. So a lot of these sporting good retailers, uh, you know, in addition to selling the equipment, they sell uh, T-shirts and, and and jerseys for these teams. So they're, they're losing out in, in that respect. Um, you know, we've seen a number of sporting good retailers, uh, Gander Mountain now issued a Models, not be able to make it and have to file bankruptcy. Yeah, I, I know uh, my house, we haven't made the annual trip to go buy cleats and a new glove this year. So, so obviously, you know, there's others in that, in that same situation. Um, I think we have uh, one, one final question. Uh, do you feel more positive about retailers that sell hand sanitizer, soap products, uh, et cetera, like Bath and Body Works, uh, Bed Bath Beyond, et cetera, versus clothing retailers or other mall retailers uh, being treated with similar risk assumptions. So I think uh, there, there's retailers that cross over into the PPE and disinfectant world. Uh, do we see them faring better than this or, or, uh, or are they along for the ride with everyone else? Uh, I'll, I'll answer first and then let Ruben. Uh, if you're a pharmaceutical company, you're selling all that stuff, you're one of the essential stores that are open, you're doing relatively well. Uh, if you're selling uh, bed, bath, and body works or whatever, you're not essential and, and you may well be closed down. Also, you don't have the supply chain in place to ramp up your sales of particular products that quickly. Uh, the wholesalers and manufacturers aren't keeping up with it. So I don't see big gains for them uh, versus the uh, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, the pharmaceutical uh, retailers, rather, I should say. And yes, then a... uh, we've, we've had a few more questions come in. This is great. Um, as far as the easing of restrictions and reopening, uh, what's Kufas's expectation or outlook on a second wave of uh, infection, and uh, what's our expectation, regard our expectation regarding? Uh, you know, the, the, I guess the, the 2020, 2021 uh, school year and as it affects supplies across the, you know, from school supplies to school furniture, things like that moving forward. 
Um, so for, for the second wave of the pandemic, uh, that's our risk scenario. Uh, our baseline is that there will be no uh, there will be no no second wave. Uh, but what what is really important to know is that things will probably not return to normal uh, if we don't have a treatment or a vaccine. Um, so that's that's continue to. Uh, to put a strain on on many sectors um, and uh, and for 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 the more specific questions on on, on school supplies, um, well, uh, technically uh, there should be no problem for for kids going back to school uh, uh, in September. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully they will be able to to go back uh, to school uh, in September if there's no second wave. So it shouldn't change uh, the, the the consumer's behavior on, on that on that regard. How will COFAS be able to support and extend credit for retailers with all the uncertainty? And how will retailers last with no credit support? You know, I think the question is, what what does the retail sector look like, not next quarter, but a year from now? Um, it's going to be a difficult transition. Um, you know, the the market has less capacity as, as more and more um, debtors come under stress. Um, certainly the good ones will, will be supported, the marginal ones to some extent, but the problematic ones um, may, may not be around. All right. And then, uh... We have a question specifically about what category fertilizer falls under. I don't know how much of that falls under general chemicals uh, in our in our industry sectors, and then how much the retail consumption of fertilizers makes up of that market. So for for fertilizer, uh, it's uh, it's mostly in the chemical sector, um, and what. Uh, it's mostly in the chemical sector that, that we usually uh, address them. Uh, for, for the chemicals, what we've seen is that it's the supply chain has been impacted like, like many others, but the first figures that, that I've seen is that it's been somehow more resilient. Uh, uh, but uh, but uh, um, I, that's that's not in the in the that's not specifically in the figures here. Thanks, Ruben. I think that wraps up the questions we have so far. Um, Ruben, thank you. Ken, uh, thank you so much for for joining us and and sharing in the answering. Um, everyone who's attended, uh, thank you for for being a part of this. Uh, to be reminded, the handout is available in the handout section for the for the slideshow. Um, thanks so much, everyone. Uh, continue to, to be safe and diligent as we uh, as we move through this uh, this environment we're in, and uh, everyone be healthy. Thanks so much for for attending today.